Welcome to the latest edition of our AT Carney Procurement and Analytic Solutions, the Wave of the Future podcast series. I'm Helen Clegg, and I'm joined today by John Piatek, a manager with AT Carney based out of our Chicago office. In today's podcast, we're going to be talking about integrating two procurement organizations after a merger or acquisition. What happens to procurement organizations when their company is acquired or is merged with another company? What risks does procurement face and what happens to the different sets of supplies and contracts that each procurement department has been dealing with? These are some of the questions we'll be answering in the podcast. Welcome, John. I'd like to start by asking how procurement is viewed in M&A transactions and how this has changed over the past few years. Thank you, Helen. M&A activity is returning following a period of low confidence and constrained capital. In all transactions, being the bid premium requires a concerted focus on the sources of synergy and value while managing the risks and protecting the revenues. Critical success is management devoting time to the right tasks and avoiding unwanted distractions. Typically, supply management is considered exclusively as a value capture activity identifying common high-spend categories and aggressively exploit the increased volume and leverage. As a quick win, it allows executives to point their shareholders to measurable value, building confidence with shareholders and integration teams alike. CPOs are dispatched with aggressive targets in order to refocus their joint teams on a priority list of categories. However, Many transactions result from companies focusing on core activities and divesting non-core business units and assets. In these cases, supply management risks, usually underestimated, have the potential to derail the early focus on integration. Many companies fail to recognize this, resulting in integration delays, increased costs, excessive senior management focused, shareholder concerns, and reduced morale within the integration teams. John, given these complexities that you've just described and the focus on value capture and supply risk, what are the main types of M&A transaction and how do these differ from from the point of view of risk? Depending on the type of transaction, the risks that senior management will have to manage are very different. When a target business is acquired, whether the acquiring party has purchased all or a portion of the business and whether the whole entity or just the legal shell is part of the transaction will determine what type of risk that may emerge. Consider the following examples. The first example is a buying party purchases the whole entity and full business of acquired business. Contracts of the acquired business will need to be assigned to the new business entity. While this is typically low risk, there is potential for disruption when contract terms are unclear or restrictive. Second type is when a buying party purchases a portion of an acquired business. Contracts will then suffer volume loss, potentially increasing rates, and supplier actions will need to be mitigated to avoid disruption or an increase in costs. In the third type, a buying party acquires the legal shell and a portion of acquired business. This is potentially the most challenging scenario as contracts are subjected to volume losses and other contractual restrictions, and simultaneously they must be untangled and novated from the original ownership. Lastly, the fourth type is when buying party purchases the full business and legal shell of an acquired business. For the new business to use existing contracts, they must be novated to the new business entity. John, you said earlier that the risk to supply management is usually underestimated when a merger or acquisition is taking place. What are the three main types of risk from your perspective, and please would you describe each one? A carve-out transaction is a good example of how to illustrate the different types of risks. The first risk is the risk to supply continuity. Typically, the buying party is unable to assume the acquired party's contracts, which are in the name of, or may be needed by, the parent company. All contracts need to be transferred or novated from the selling party before they can be used by the new business. Even those that can be transferred may be subjected to change of control clauses. The problem is made worse by legal restrictions on the level of communication that can occur with suppliers prior to merger and the willingness of these suppliers to engage. Some are notorious for failing to do so, maximizing their own power. 
Furthermore, in some deal structures, new companies are created and a supplier may question the new company's creditworthiness. This can be managed, but constrains renegotiation and absorbs time. The second risk is the risk to supply costs. Loss of access to parent company contracts risks reducing volumes, either directly through the split contracts or indirectly because of coincident categories. For some categories, combination with the buying company's volumes will offset the reduction in buying power. In other cases, volumes will fall and leverage is reduced. Even when there are coincident volumes, the new entity may find itself locked into multiple contracts with different suppliers, with penalties for early cancellation. In other cases, there may be clauses referring to volume commitments. Finally, the third risk is the risk from organizational change. The carved out company may not have its own dedicated procurement professionals, having previously relied on a parent company's shared service provision, or it may have acquired questionable assets, the seller having kept its high ability talented. In either case, the team will typically be remote from the buyer, often without management support, and used to following different processes. Furthermore, although service agreements may have been negotiated, the selling company may have limited motivation or commitment to assist new business in optimizing its supply base. In these circumstances, two problems tend to arise. First, with a temporary and dramatic increase in workload, procurement professionals can accept price leakage or suboptimal contracts as a means of preserving supply and reducing the backlog. Second, senior executives start to spend excessive amounts of time in supply continuity negotiations for critical categories, preventing them from focusing on the value generating logic of the integration in the first place. So John, it sounds like supplier reactions to emerger integration can also be an unforeseen source of risk. Can you comment further on why this is challenging for businesses that are merging? Any one of these risks could be individually managed. However, during a merger, they can occur together and over a short time frame. The negotiating power is often transferred, temporarily or permanently, to the supplier. And there are examples of suppliers who are organized to exploit this. Suppliers can also then use supply continuity risk to set timeframes and further leverage price at a time when the new organization cannot easily organize itself to respond. So that the integration of the procurement organizations doesn't get derailed, it needs to be carefully managed. John, tell me about the four key steps that you've identified so that companies integrating their procurement organizations get it right. Pre-merger planning is the cornerstone of risk mitigation efforts. It is of critical importance to develop the strategy upfront and execute it with the correct level of an organization and resources. In our experience, there are four key steps. First is to assign resources and set objectives. Create an upfront and agreed plan for risk mitigation and apply interim resource to provide bandwidth. This will help coordinate the new procurement group. Second, to focus on supplier and contract assessments. Conduct a formal risk assessment independently with each party of the merger to identify where supply risk may emerge and what suppliers could be troublesome. A clean room should also be set up to review contracts prior to the merger and prioritize opportunities for cost reduction and issues of risk. Third, create workflows and agree approach establishing structured workflows and processes to handle contract transfers and innovations is critical. Work should be prioritized and escalation criteria defined so that senior managers are faced with exception issues only. Finally, supplier engagement. Engaging with the supply market, focusing high-risk suppliers first, track the progress, monitor outcomes, and identify any developing operational risks. I want to hone in on the second step you mentioned there, John, about assessing suppliers and contracts. How can this be done effectively and efficiently? There are a few elements of this. First, a full contract and supplier audit is necessary. Focusing on troublesome categories is quite useful, such as IT. Contracts need to be gathered, and a structured risk assessment is necessary. This allows a business to prioritize the contract transfer process between the first 0 to 60 days 
one should focus on all those high risk suppliers and then beyond that layer in the medium and lower risk ones. And for categories that typically take a long time to resolve, such as IT and telecom, they need to be started immediately. When you start a project to support two procurement organizations that are about to be integrated, you normally define a set of guiding principles. What are these guiding principles, John, for procurement merger integration? While the specific principles may vary across businesses, there are some common themes. Continuity of business operations on day one is critical and must be preserved. Both parties need to make all best efforts to transfer agreements prior to the close date. A grace period should be used to permit use of parent company contracts while the contract transfer process is underway. And finally, both parties will work together towards a clean split with separate agreements in a realistic time frame. And John, the last question to you during uh, today's podcast. What about the actual integration of the procurement organizations from a staffing perspective and the development of the new procurement organization? What's the best way to approach this? It is important to set the objectives of the procurement team. This team needs to manage combined third party spend. They need to procure for the business at the lowest cost to serve at an acceptable level of risk. They'll need to install sufficient spend controls and drive value capture efforts required by the shareholders. They will also need to enable the business to run effectively. This may require recruiting more members to the procurement team, integrating the merging businesses procurement functions, providing timely support to the business, avoiding unnecessary bureaucracy, creating new ways of working for the new company, and finally, uh, establishing training and development requirements for the new business. So to summarize, the merger of two procurement organizations is a complex operation. While capturing value may lie at the heart of the integration, there is inherent risk, for example, risk of continued supply and risk to supply costs. Key success factors include planning and prioritization, the development of a set of guiding principles and clear communication. On that note, I'd like to thank John Piatek in Chicago for being my, my guest today. I'd also like to thank our production engineer, Tom Klein, based in San Francisco. Thank you for listening to this edition of The Wave of the Future. If you have any comments on this podcast or have a suggestion for a podcast topic, please share your thoughts via Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at ATKPAS. This has been an AT Carney Procurement and Analytics Solutions podcast production. Join us again soon for our next Wave of the Future podcast. Thank you.